QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Write checks for expenses and prepaid assets. Let's do it with Intuit QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Here we are in QuickBooks Desktop, Get Great Guitars Practice File. We started up in a prior presentation, going through the setup process we do every time, maximizing the home page to the gray area of view drop down. We have the hide icon bar in open windows list checked off, open windows open on the left side. Reports drop down, company and financial, P and L, profit and loss, change in the range, 01023 to 123 customizing the report to increase the size a bit in the fonts the numbers changing it let's bring it up to 14 14 is our new our new standard yes please okay let's open up the reports again this time company financial and the balance sheet standard report customization ranges they are a changing 010123 to 123123 and then we'll customize that one too and make it 14 and okay yes please and okay let's open up the trial balance as well just to get used to that in our startup process it's under an accounting and taxes trial balance very useful report the range ins they are a change in so this is from 01 01 23 to 12 31 23 customize it and we'll just crank that one up a notch to 16 16 how about that that's how crazy we are around here there we go, wild and crazy. Okay, so there it is. So that's our normal <clears throat> setup process that we do every time. Let's jump back over to the home page. We're now gonna be thinking about cash outflows, typical cash outflows that we would think happen on a reoccurring nature at the end of the month. Things like the utility bill, the phone bill, for example, and so on and so forth. Couple ways we can enter these items into our system. One is with a check form, the check form decreasing the checking account, the other side going to an expense or possibly to a prepaid asset type of account, as we will see. We can then enter the bill form, which would increase the accounts payable, allow us then to sort the bills and then pay the bills as they become due. We're gonna do this method in the second month of operations in the first month at this point, we're just going to be writing the check forms. The third way that we can enter this into the system is with the use of the bank feeds. Now, we're going to have a whole other section or course on the bank feeds, but we just want to mention them as they might fit into the system and when they might fit into the system. So with the bank feeds, you might wait till something actually clears the bank before you record it, which is a little bit backwards because in a full service accounting system, we would record the item first then when it clears the bank, we match it out with the bank reconciliation, which we can use the bank feeds to help us out with that. If we're waiting for it to clear the bank before we record it, we're doing a step further than a cash based system, making things a little bit easier uh, than they otherwise would be. But that would only work in certain situations. For example, one, we're not having accounts payable. We don't need to enter the bill and track the accounts payable. And uh, two, we have electronic transfers. That's typically when it's gonna work best. And many small businesses do at this point, paying things like their utility bill and paying things like their phone bill and so on with an electronic transfer coming directly out of the bank or possibly with a credit card, both of which are gonna be electronic transactions. And because the time frame for them to go through the bank is so short and you can verify that they have cleared quite quickly, then it becomes more and more doable and advantageous to kind of wait for those transactions to clear the bank and use the bank feeds to actually record the check or to record the credit card rather than recording it first when we enter the transaction and then using the bank feeds or reconciliations to verify that we've recorded the transaction. The electronic transfers also have the advantage of when they go through the bank feeds having a memo which usually gives you the vendor information allowing you to kind of uh, be able to set up your bank feeds in terms of who the vendor is and then possibly have memorized transactions as well note that many small businesses will often if they have sufficient cash flow or if they're using the credit cards for example be on more of a cash based system or reliant on the bank feeds to record the cash outflows for goods and services they are using within the business but on the customer side of things the revenue cycle might be on an accrual basis or not being reliant on the bank feeds 
because of the industry they are in, they have to enter an invoice or possibly use a sales receipt and then make the deposit due to that industry uh, that they are in. So just to, to mention that and keep that in mind. Now, if you're writing physical checks, then it becomes a lot uh, advantageous to actually enter the checks into the system when you write them, because then there's gonna be a significant lag between when you write the check and when the check clears the bank, because you gotta mail the check, they have to receive it, and then they have to clear the bank. And so if there's any questions about whether they got the check, did it get lost in the mail? We have to then enter the check in our system. So if they ask us about it, we can see that we wrote the check. So in that system, you don't want to be waiting until the check clears the bank to put it into the system because the whole point is to note that you recorded the check when you wrote it and then you can track whether the check is outstanding. Again, electronic transfers, not as big a problem because those things clear in like one to three days. They, they can clear almost automatically these days. And so that lag time is not becoming as, as big of an issue and therefore waiting for it to clear the bank and then recording it is more and more doable. Although, uh, you, so that means that we're gonna write a check form this time and the second month we're gonna write uh, bill forms. So the check form would be used when either physically writing a check, possibly you're buying checks and then you're entering them into the printer and printing on the checks out of QuickBooks or you're handwriting checks and just entering the check into the system in QuickBooks or you're doing an electronic transfer but still doing a full service bookkeeping system where you record the transaction as you make the transaction and then reconcile it to the bank uh, using the bank feeds or using the bank reconciliation process. Okay, so when we enter these items into the system, we could use a check form or we could use the register. Now note, oftentimes if, it, if I'm, uh, my default would generally be to use the register. In other words, remember the, the process, the thought process you want to go through when entering any transaction is first, is there a form that should be used for the transaction? If so, I would use that particular form. If there's not a form, then is cash affected? If cash is affected, I would typically use the register. So in this case, there's a form, it's a check form, but that's usually a form that I would use the register for in practice, because it's a little bit faster to enter. But here I kind of want to emphasize the checks. So I'm actually going to write the checks using the check form. Remember that the check form is the form that's going to be a reduction to the checking account. So if it's an actual physical check that's being represented or will be made from QuickBooks or you're handwriting the check and then you're matching it up to the QuickBooks system, it will then have a check number related to it. If it's going to be a decrease to the checking account for an electronic payment, then you want to delete the check number because it's because it's still going to be decreasing the checking account, but it's not an actual check, even though this is still the form used to decrease the checking account. We're going to make this as of 012622. I'm going to say this is going to go for insurance. I'm going to call, I'm going to make up a new vendor, Safe Insurance Company, which is obviously a very generic name. I'm going to say tab note when we set up the vendors, typically I don't need a whole lot of detail. I don't need to know their phone number, their address and so on and so forth, unless I'm going to mail it to them, right? In which case I might want that, but typically we just want a quick ad and we're going to add them. We're going to add them as a vendor. So I'm going to add them as a vendor. Note that if you're using bank feeds, then sometimes you can enter the bank feeds without the, the vendor field and people skip that sometimes. You, you want to add a vendor, which you can usually get from the memo because the vendor allows you to sort your data by vendor. So you get another sort field. If you don't have the vendor, you'll still record it to the correct account. Hopefully your financial statements will still be correct, but you won't have the added detail of sorting who you paid by vendor. So then we're gonna, I'm gonna say this is 12,000 here. And then, and, and then we might want a memo down here in terms of what we paid for. I might say this is for a, a, let's say a, a year of insurance. Now the one we first started out with and notice we're on the expense side, not the item side. Items are if we were to purchase inventory, expenses are gonna go directly to an account. We started out with one with, which is a little bit unusual because the insurance, if we pay all the insurance for a six month time period or a year time period at one time, for example, it's often cheaper to do so. But if I expense it when I pay for it, then if I imagine my income statement here, and if I was to compare January to December, 
and I paid for a whole year's worth of insurance in January, then uh, it would look like January was, was worse than December because I'd have this big expense. That's similar to the concept of, it's basically the same as the concept of the fixed asset, the property, plant, and equipment, where if I bought a building and I paid cash for it, that would clearly majorly distort the, the income statement from mo one month to the next, one year to the next. That's why we use the accrual concept, putting it on the books as an asset. So we can do the same thing with insurance. It's not as extreme of an issue as the fixed assets, but it's still something that I might, if I pay for a whole year's worth of insurance, want to put it on the books as an asset. So I'm gonna do that here. Note that uh, insurance is one of those places where you say, well, it's not that big a deal, so I'm just gonna expense it as I pay for it. You may be able to do that. You might wanna to talk to your accountant uh, to determine whether or not it would be applicable or whether or not you wanna do an accrual kind of component there. You have to do it for equipment because it's such a huge deviation. Insurance, maybe you don't need to. It would be the easiest thing to do would be just to expense it, although it's not it's not as comparable. But I'm gonna show the example of the prepaid insurance. Normally you wanna put it into prepaid insurance and then allocate it using period end adjustments, which we'll see in future presentations. So I don't think we have an account for it yet. So I'm gonna add an account. I'm gonna call it a an asset account, which is in the dropdown. It's gonna be an other, other current asset account. I'm gonna say, okay. I'm gonna call it prepaid insurance, prepaid insurance. So insurance that we have that we have bought, that we haven't consumed. When do we consume insurance? As the policy expires. By definition, you've gotta pay for the insurance before they give you the coverage. So we're gonna say, okay. And that's different by the way, that looks good, than any, than any other, most other things. Most other things, you pay the utility bill after you used the util, you, utilities. For insurance, you pay for the insurance before you get the coverage. That's why you get into this prepayment problem or issue. So let's say save it and close it. This is gonna decrease the checking account. The other side's gonna go into an asset rather than an, an expense. Let's do it. Let's say go to the balance sheet and check it out. Double clicking on the checking account. And I can say, okay, now I entered it into the wrong date, didn't I? Let me change the date to 2022. And let's see, there it is. Fix the date. Pay attention, man. I'm crying out loud. This needs to be 23. You're, you're, I'm working in the future. I don't usually work in the future. So give me a break. But notice how you can change it. You can double click and change it. Quite useful when you're working a practice problem, saving it. Boom, there it is. So there it is. I fixed it. I fixed it, okay. The other side's gonna go to prepaid insurance. There it is, it's a balance sheet account. So we put it here, when is it gonna be expensed? We're gonna expend it at, expense it at the end of the month or year in accordance with how much of the insurance we have consumed. So we'll talk more about that when we get to the adjusting entries. Similar kind of concept though, as with the fixed assets, basically the same kind of concept, although we won't be using a separate account like accumulated depreciation will just decrease the insurance directly. Why? Because it's not an estimate. Down here, it's like kind of an estimate. Up here, we know how much was covered so we can hit it directly with a ratio and determine how much was used and how much was not used. We'll talk more about that later. Let's do another one. So if I go back to the home page, now note if I enter another check here, well, I went to the register. You could enter that, notice how it see you see it in the register. So you could enter that directly into the register. If you're doing a whole year's worth of data input, for example, the register would probably be the faster way to go. I'm gonna close this back out. I'm gonna go back into the check form so we can see the full form though. Notice if I type in again, the, the uh, same vendor, which was safe insurance, it's now populating here and it will now populate down here. Now, how it populates down below will be a little bit different depending on your settings, which we looked up in a prior presentation. If I go to the edit preferences and I look at my settings, I think I changed it from this one in, in general, automatically remember account or transaction information, automatically recall last transaction. So that means it's pulling in the number and everything, but it also pulls in the account, which can be quite useful. All right, now we're gonna do a different one though. We're gonna say this is gonna be from Staples. Staples, I'm gonna type in, this is a new vendor. So I'll type it in, 
tab. This is like a, a department or, you know, a store for a supply store. I'm going to quick add it. I'm going to add it, quick add as a vendor because it's something someone we're paying. Now it's still keeping the data from, from that last vendor. So that's okay. I'm going to say, all right, this is for $500, same date. But this time it's going to go to office supplies, office supplies. And I'm going to put it in as an expense. Now note, I didn't have to add a new account for office supplies because they already had that office supplies account as the account in the general ledger from the default general ledger that was set up. The normal process, if I'm starting a new company file is that I'm going to use the default general ledger accounts that were set up when I started the company. I'm going to, I'm going to try to find one that fits every time I knew a new transaction. If I can't find one that I like, I'm going to say, is there one that's close? and possibly then change the name to the name that I prefer so that I don't have multiple accounts that are in essence doing the same thing. And if it's not there at all, as we saw with the prior one, we can then add the account uh, as necessary. And then possibly in a few months, we can go back in and delete any accounts that we are not using, which will hopefully clean things up and make it a little bit easier when we hit the drop down and kind of look through all of the accounts. So that's going to be that. We might want to put a memo here. Also note that supplies is another area where you might do the same concept. So if I'm buying large supplies, let's say you're buying medical supplies, for example, then you might be tracking it. If I go back to the balance sheet in a similar way as you would with inventory, because they're a significant uh, dollar amount and, and therefore you want to track the supplies like you would inventory kind of, or at least on a perpetual inventory system putting it on the books as an asset uh, rather than expensing it. But if you're buying small supplies like staples and things like that, and you're not as concerned with tracking it and doing a periodic adjustment, which takes longer to do, then you could just expense it. So we're going to use the method here of just expensing. We'll show the concept of the prepaid item and allocation of it with the prepaid insurance. But again, the same concept can be done with supplies. Oftentimes accounting textbooks will use supplies as an introduction into inventory and tracking inventory because it's a similar process if you have substantial supplies. But it's easiest to just expense it if that would be applicable. So let's save it and close it. Do I have the right date? No, this is 2023. Everything looks good. Okay, got it. So let's go ahead and say double click on the checking account. There's the supplies. If I double click on it, back to the check, that looks good. The other side this time is going to go to the profit and loss PNL. So there it is on the PNL. And so it's an increase in the expense, which decreases the net income. Let's do another one. Let's go back to the, to the homepage and say, we're going to say another one. Now notice if it was the second month, I'm going to say tab tab. That looks good. If it was the second month of operations, and if I was to then enter the same transactions in again, remember it would memorize that it would, it would help me to record the transaction, helping me to be consistent with the expense accounts. We want to be consistent with our allocation of the expense accounts. So this one's going to be our utility bill, which is Edison. I'm going to type in a new vendor, say tab. It's going to help us to add the vendor. I'm just going to do a quick add as we have done before. It will be a vendor because we're going to be paying them. And I'm going to say this is for 620, 620. We might want to put in the memo what month we're paying for and so on and so forth, but I'll keep it as is. Now, when we choose the expense account, the idea would be, I'm going to see if there's an expense account that's going to be applicable. If there's not one, is there one that's close that I can change? If there's one that's not close at all, I'll choose something else. It's, it's also useful to note that really there's no uh, something, it's nothing cut in stone in terms of which accounts you need to be assigning to on, especially on the expenses, because different companies are going to have different things that are going to be more or less useful to them. So for example, it used to be the standard would be that the phone bill, the gas bill, and the electric bill would be grouped together under utilities. However, the standard for most companies these days is that the phone bill is becoming its own expense. Why? Because it's becoming large enough that you want to break it out into its, its, its own expense. And oftentimes the electric bill and utility bill still seem for, for a lot of companies to be put together or grouped together. So what you want to do, and I've seen people go on two extremes of grouping their expenses. One 
is to have too few expenses. So you like you could imagine putting all your expenses into one account called business expenses, but that wouldn't give you much detail on what you're spending money in. So you want to give more detail than that. The other extreme is to have a different expense account for every little thing. You're, cat you're over categorizing your expense accounts, which gives you a lot of detail. But if you have expense accounts that only have like $10 in it for a larger company or even a small company with $10, then you're probably going to have a very long income statement with unnecessary detail. It would be, you'd be better off making decisions to group that stuff together. So for here, for example, we could put it into utilities. We might make another account if we spend a lot of electricity. So if we're, if we're, if our guitar shop is plugged in, we're amped all the time. We got the amplifiers blaring. And so then when I want to track my electric bill separately from my gas bill, then I might do that, right? Because that would be applicable. That would be something I want to know about. If not, I'll put them, to, I'll group them together. All right. So this is going to decrease the checking account. The other side is going to go to utilities. I'll say save it and close it. Let's go to the profit and loss. And so there's utilities expense. Another way people might group their utilities is you might see it grouped as utilities and then sub accounts of say gas, uh, electric and the phone bill. And in that way you can then, it'll have a carrot kind of like this that you can, you can group up. I've seen other people that really like sub accounts, but again, you can go over the top with sub accounts. Sub accounts can give you a lot more control because you might, you might want the phone bill to be next to the, the electric bill. But if you put them in separate accounts it's, and you don't have account numbers, it's going to be ordered by alphabetical order in the expenses area. So one way you can have controlling of the grouping of different accounts that you want in separate accounts, but still be next to each other is the use of sub accounts. But that makes your income statement a lot larger. We'll, we might touch in on sub accounts in the future, you know, as we go here. If I go up to the balance sheet, we can see the checking account here, checking account. We've got the Edison bill. So there it is. The other side going to utilities indicated here. Let's do one more. I'm going to go back to the homepage, at least one more. We're going to go the phone bill now. That's a typical month end bill. Now, if you set up bank feeds and you make these electronic transfers, you can try to memorize these transactions and you can get them to be you know, somewhat automatic. But even if you're just entering them manually into the system, it'll at least help you to memorize the account to make the data input as easy as possible. I'm gonna say this is Verizon, is our phone company, tab, quick add for the vendor. And then the amount I'm gonna say is 410, tab, tab. We might want a memo telling us which month we're paying for. And then down here, we're gonna say this is a telephone account. So I'm typing in telephone, I have never posted the telephone before, but the system already has a telephone account because it's fairly standard these days to break out the phone bill from the utility bill. So I'll put it there. If I wanted the phone bill to be next to the, to the electric bill, I might then make it again as a subcategory of utilities, for example. So let's go ahead and record this. I'll say save it and close it. Let's check it out, profit and loss. Now there's the telephone, telephone, and if I go back to the balance sheet, we've got the checking account. Here's the checking account for the 410. Now these we're imagining we wrote physical checks for. So when we actually do the bank reconciliation, comparing our books to the bank, we're gonna have the check numbers and the amounts to help us tie it out. If we were imagining electronic transfers, then again, we might wait for it to clear the bank before we record the transaction then because the transaction doesn't have as big of a time interval here we want to see make sure that these outstanding checks are outstanding right that's part of the point or we might still enter the electronic transfers as we make them in a full service accounting system but when they when they come through the bank then the the bank is not going to have a check number anymore however it often has more detail in the memo like who we paid the memo often includes you know the vendor that's going to be included in it which helps us then to to label the account that we wanted to go to as well as uh set set the vendor name so just to touch on the different components again we have a whole nother course or section on the bank feeds we'll talk about later but just to give an idea of how different companies might be uh putting those into place or making their normal month-end payments 
Okay, so also now we can go, if I go back to the home page here in the vendor section, if I can search by vendor up top now, I can go to the vendor center. Let's do it that way. And because I added the vendors, now I've got, of course, my vendor information here. And if I look at all transactions and all dates, then I've got my check and I can see, I can sort my data, you know, by vendor, which, which is a nice, a nice capacity. If you're using bank feeds, remember, you could possibly enter the data without adding a vendor and your financial statements may still be populated properly because you're still recording it to the proper account, but you're not gonna have that added detail of being able to sort and look through your vendor information. If there's a question, if you get an email or some they're questioning a vendor is a question, a payment, then you wanna be able to go to the vendor center and be able to see the payment that has, has been processed or if it's a check, the payment that's going to be basically outstanding. You can say, oh yeah, well, I wrote the check here. I sent it out at this date. Maybe it got lost in the mail would be, you know, the general process. So there is that. Let's go back up to the, let's go to the trial balance now. And here's what we have thus far on the trial balance. Now in the next month, we're going to enter the same checks at the end or the same payments or the same kind of payments, but we'll do it with a bill and then a pay bill, and then we'll have a whole nother section on uh, on bank feeds or, or a course on bank feeds. Okay, so let's go back to the trial balance. Here's where we stand at this point in time. You can check your numbers. If everything ties out, great. If not, try changing the date range. It's often a date issue. If there's an issue uh, with the, the issue, then you could double click, zoom in, and possibly change anything that you need to change, which you wanna be careful of in practice, but it's a great tool for this practice problem.